Hello, animation fans, and welcome to another iAnimate podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez. In this episode, we have Conan Lowe joining us. Uh, Conan is a 20-year veteran to our industry. Um, he's also one of our uh, previous instructors and uh, teaching here. It was really neat to talk with Conan. Um, anytime you, I get a chance to talk with somebody who's passionate about our industry and um, who's been doing it for this long, it's just a neat opportunity to pick their brain. He's worked on such films as Madagascar 3, Penguins of Madagascar. Um, over at ILM, he worked on Rogue One, um, Solo. And uh, he also goes back to um, one of some of the first, I think it was the first um, CG animated TV series reboot. Um, so again, just need an opportunity to talk with somebody who has this much experience and is passionate about our industry. So check it out. All right, Conan, first of all, I'd like to thank you for joining us in this podcast. It's always a neat pleasure to get guys like you who have had a lot of experience in the industry um, and to kind of pick your brains a little bit. So I do appreciate your time with us. Yeah, great. I'm happy to be here. All right. That and the fact that you're one of our instructors is another cool aspect. So yeah, yeah. very cool. Um, can you tell us, as we kind of start out in this this journey here on this podcast, how you came into CG, VFX, animation, and all that? Um, obviously, yeah. you're one of our uh, uh, previous instructors here, so even that route as well. So how'd you come into this industry? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll start sort of at the beginning, which is uh, when I... Uh, was picking, uh, you know, a college route. I um, went to the Art Center College of Design, um, mostly because they were really uh, famous for their illustration school. So I was uh, an illustration major there, learning how to paint and draw. And, um, you know, they also had a, a fairly illustrious uh, entertainment uh, history in that Sid Mead had gone there and, you know, was uh, studied product design there before he became, you know, a, an entertainment designer. Um, so, you know, it was a really great environment there in terms of learning how to, you know, do the fundamentals of just drawing the figure, drawing from life, mm -hmm. painting. And then maybe about a year before I graduated, Toy Story came out in theaters. <laughs> so that, that sort of was like the game changer for me because I sat in that theater and just saw something that was, you know, totally unlike anything I had ever experienced, you know, in cinema. And, um, you know, before that, I had always been a fan of animation. I had, you know, like been gone to all the Disney movies and really loved 2D animation. I had actually taken summers at CalArts, and so I had learned how to do 2D animation as well. Cool. But then this was sort of like this whole other way to leverage upon, um, you know, the change and the explosive growth in you know, computer graphics. And it just happened that Art Center had this computer graphics laboratory that had been, uh, recently built and paid for by Ford Motor Company because one of Art Center's other primary, you know, uh, strengths was that it was a product and automotive design school. Oh, very cool. So we had this full lab of SGI computers, um, which were very expensive at the time. Yeah. You know, um, you know, when I was picking school, I was picking between RISD and Art Center, and I remember going to RISD's computer lab, and they had like two Mac SEs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then going into Art Center, and Art Center had this giant new lab that had been built by Ford and had just been used uh, as the uh, backdrop set for In the Line of Fire as FBI headquarters because it was so <laughs> 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 so, um, You know, I was like, oh, this is where I've got to go. And, it, and when Toy Story came out and they had this laboratory, it was like, oh, well, I, I want to learn how to do this because you know, we knew that these computers could do that same type of animation work. Good. Yeah. And so there was a whole bunch of us that were sort of in this generation of like illustration classes, product design classes, and we were basically co-opting these product design computer courses and trying to do computer animation in them. Um, you know, one of those uh, people was Ryan Church, who was an old coworker of mine at ILM, and you know, who's a product uh, production designer there. Mm. And so. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be basically all of us, you know, taking instruction on how to use the software, but instead of doing car renderings, we were making our own little animations. <laughs> um, so this, this kind of served as a really great foundation for me coming out of school because it felt like everybody, uh, whether you're in visual effects or animation, was trying to figure out how to use computers to, you know, create and make interesting new content. And so when I, you know, uh, was finishing up school, I got an internship in Vancouver at Mainframe Entertainment. 
and uh, Mainframe was making the first computer-generated animated television series, uh, which was Reboot on ABC. Okay, I remember that. Yeah, so that Reboot was, cool. was uh, one of the shows they were making, and then Beast Wars was a Transformers anime. Ah, I loved Beast Wars, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in Canada, it was called Beasties, because you couldn't say war in Canada. So <laughs> it was this big roar to be like, Beasties. Um, but uh, so those were really cool shows to kind of work on as a student, because then it got from me, you know, trying to, you know, commandeer this computer lab where we didn't have any structure to going to a place where they had sort of figured out how to make a pipeline for making okay. things. And so it was sort of learning about, well, these are the breakdowns of how the, you know, the jobs are within a production environment. This is the way you schedule out a production. And, um, and you know, this is where you kind of create content from script to, you know, delivery. So it was a, it was a really great kind of learning foundation for me in terms of animation. Pipeline, huh? Yeah, exactly. So then coming back to school and finishing up, um, you know, after I graduated, I did a little bit of freelance work in visual effects. And then uh, there was an advertisement, I think it was on the recycler. <laughs> this is like free Craigslist. <laughs> so basically a job post that I saw on the internet somewhere for like, you know, new animation production for uh, Matt Groening show. And at the time, the only show that was uh, going on was The Simpsons. And so this was like a whole new thing. And so I, you know, applied kind of blindly and got an interview. And um, it ended up that I joined as like, you know, artist number nine on Futurama, which was Matt's uh, new show. That he okay. Was, like the sort of science fiction fantasy. And, you know, when I got there, they basically had a, a two minute animation test that they had done to win the contract. Um, and then they... Uh, had these post-it notes that Matt had drawn of all the main characters. <laughs> and so it was a really great, this was like another thing of me just sort of being in the right place at the right time where, uh, you know, there were four of us that they had hired to do CG. We had a 22 episode schedule, you know, it was, we were trying to figure out how to create 3D animation that integrated with the 2D drawings, you know, of, you know, Matt's style. And so we were basically using alias wavefronts power animator which is okay. pretty maya version and um, we're rendering you know creating 3d assets but doing tune shading and then uh, compositing and soft homage tunes oh wow yeah okay. um so lots of like experimentation lots of creative freedom and um like i'd say almost on a Every episode, there were two or three weeks where we do like 100 plus hours a week, <laughs> staying at the studio. We had a render farm of, I think, oh, four man. machines, aside from our desk machines. And so we were, it was, you know, it was a really great time for me, though, because, you know, coming out of school, getting this first kind of full-time job as in you know, a production allowed me to wear a lot of hats because, you know, they, they had these ideas for how to do, execute these shots. The directors would come up with these thumbnails. But then it was all up to us to, you know, build the assets in 3D, model them, rig them, uh, shade them with the tune shader, time out, get our, our scenes approved with final animation, do the rendering and the compositing, and then wow. integrate it with the 2D assets that were coming back from Korea. So, um, you know, there was, there, was a, there was that level of work going on at other places like Disney, but this was like in their feature animated films. Right, right. And we were doing this, you know, on a, on a 22 episode schedule. Wow. Which was, you know, kind of huge. We were generating a ton of, uh, of volume of content, you know. Per I can year. imagine, yeah. Especially having to wear so many hats too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was, you know, um, while it was kind of uh, stressful and tiresome, you know, <laughs> it was a really great experience because like there was, you know, a lot of us on that production had just come out of school, you know, me from Art Center, a bunch of other people from CalArts, uh, a bunch of guys had just finished work on Iron Giant. And so they had come over from that production. Um, so yeah, it was just a great time. And, you know, like, uh, I feel like all of the people that were kind of in that crew have all gone on to do like really amazing, great things. And gotcha. So yeah. We sort of have that foundation in terms of a you know, group of crew that we you know kind of have as a, our first production family. Right. Right. And that's very cool. Cause that's one of the reasons why we have, um, you know, obviously in our animate, we teach animation, 
Yeah. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we've incorporated so many other disciplines like pre-visualization, um, rigging and things of that nature, because it's really, really important to have a solid foundation in a lot of other aspects. Um, you know, I ended up taking a, a class with uh, Tal Schwartzman and he's a, uh, not a generalist, he's a, you know, a, um, a animator at Pixar. Yeah. Talking about how even in Incredibles 2, he had to do a little bit of uh, finagling for, um, oh shoot, what's the dad's name, darn it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. When he's taking that, uh, uh, he bites his lip and he wanted to have these little creases here when, you know, the teeth. Yeah. But some expertise outside of just animation to make that happen, you know? Yeah. So that's why I appreciate classes like what we have here that you're teaching because it allows artists to have a broader um, skill set. Yeah. And well, go further I, with it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that foundation that I got at Rough Draft, which was a studio that made Futurama really allowed me to kind of go into the other fields that I eventually did, like, you know, moving on to DreamWorks after that time, because at DreamWorks, you know, uh, they were basically making all CG features. And so that was, you know, the evolution for me going from doing 2D animation with a 3D hybrid to just doing all 3D feature productions allowed me to kind of um, take all the things that I had done at Rough Draft, wearing all those different hats, and then apply them to the layout department at DreamWorks, which gotcha. was essentially the earlier version of pre-visualization in production. Okay. So, um, you know, when I started at DreamWorks, we were basically a bunch of 3D artists and 3D technicians that were working with a lot of directors coming out of 2D animation. And so the there was a lot of interesting back and forth in terms of you know how we created our process and that the, those 2D animators were really used, or 2D directors were really used to working off of storyboards and having their storyboards be their Bible for how they created shots, uh -huh. which is you know definitely a valid and, and, and still tried and true way of you know, creating animation. But then uh, us showing them how to use CG as a method to, um, kind of more expansively create cinematic shots was kind of this real groundbreaker for us, you know, kind of moving off of just working from the storyboards because initially the process would be you get the storyboards and you just do it shot for shot. Mm -hmm. And the timing and everything was just sort of you figuring out how to translate those boards into 3D. And so you were, you were working out spatial issues, but you weren't necessarily utilizing the set that you had in the full capacity in terms of, you know, how you would shoot cinematography. Gotcha. And um, so that the real breakthrough for us happened when we started hiring live action consultants to come in mm. and kind of guide the production. So on Madagascar 2, for example, we hired Guillermo Navarro and he had just finished um, Pan's Labyrinth and won the Academy Award for that with oh. uh, Guillermo del Toro. Okay. And so there was this really great interaction with him and the directors where, you know, we would launch a sequence, we would show him the animatic, and he would look at it and he'd go, this is really boring, you guys. You guys are just talking, talking, talking. And he was really abrupt, uh, abrupt with him. He's like, this, you got to cut out here, you got to cut out here. This is like, you know, this is taking way too long. You know, like, why are we, why are we watching all these, you know, back and forth shots? So he said, what, we need to figure this out faster. So he basically would get, he switched our launches entirely so that we would get the script. They were in the boarding process as well, but we would basically get the script and we would go down to an open space that we had, um, you know, which I think was in the art department at the time. And we would basically take a, a camcorder and whatever live action sets, like a couch or some pillows or something or a wig, and we would assign animators or artists to be the different characters and we would just talk it through and we would sh walk through it like a live action shoot. Very cool. And in the process of just filming that and having the, the people say the lines and having the directors there to kind of see how they interacted with each other, they would immediately like throw out lines because they knew it was shoe leather. Or they would come up with new bits based on the way the characters were oriented again, you know, with each other on a set and you know, how they figured out how they want to shoot it. And you know, that would dynamically change the way we covered you know, the same dialogue that they were boarding. Gotcha. So you kind of got to this hybrid where, you know, they would, directors would look at scripts and they would think, well, you know, a board artist would have a lot of fun, you know, uh, 
kind of brainstorming ideas for this sequence, so let's have somebody draw it. Or this looks like an interesting dialogue scene, let's just shoot it and then see you know, what we come up with and if there's something that's missing. And so our productions uh, towards the end of my time at DreamWorks were this real hybrid of you know, live action and animation production where you, know, you would have some sequences that you would get off of storyboards and then you would have other sequences where they said, well, you know what, let's just pre-visit and see you know, how we can make this interesting if we shoot it. And you know, we, we got to the point where we would have a motion capture stage, we could have uh, performers wear suits, but then you know, uh, directors could hold a virtual camera and see how the characters looked in CG and then sort of stage it in real time. Wow. And so we had these really great collaborative sessions at the end where we had all the different department heads there, whether it was a production designer, uh, a visual effects suit, um, you know, the directors, the screenwriters, and everybody was sort of there spitballing and coming up with ideas and solutions for how to best shoot, you know, the sequence. Um, it was funny, like just looking last night at some of the clips coming out of The Lion King, you can sort of just see how that has taken that next step, right? Like, Essentially, you know, Favreau and his team had this virtual production environment where they, you know, took live action camera philosophy and applied it to this 2D production. Right, right. And you, and it's, you know, it still stays very true to the original source material, but you can see just in the camera work and the staging how there's all these sort of subtle things that they did because they had this freedom of, you know, responding to the way things looked in real time. Gotcha, gotcha. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, now, as a previous artist, how did you work with the material that you guys maybe shot with a camcorder down at DreamWorks and such? How, how did you now translate that? What was your, you know, as yeah. an animator, you get layout and then you go, okay, I got it. I understand what's happening here. And now I'm going to jump into my shot. How did you as a previous artist do the same thing with the material that you guys got from? Well, you? it's funny because, um, you know, essentially that, that became sort of like a life <clears throat> paradigm where, a, we would shoot the live action footage, we would send it to editorial, actually, and then editorial would sort of cut between the different uh, coverage that we had supplied to um, the you know, department. And so what we would get back was a live action cut based on the shoot that we had done you know, down on the art space. Okay. So that, that previous process then became us sort of working with um, you know, this cut that was more defined in terms of a, a, it was basically, you know, a lot of times it was really disturbing because it'd be like me with a wig on, but then <laughs> still a voice coming out of, you know, because <laughs> you know, it's like that sort of scratch coming out. <laughs> so, you know, like it was this kind of negotiating, like, okay, this, what is the intent here that we're trying to resolve and then get it back into, um, the, the, you know, that process is really good, I think, in terms of the directors figuring out how to kind of, you know, uh, visualize what coverage they wanted to do. But the reason why we ended up going to that um, motion capture paradigm is because then, you know, the, the spatial issues that we were dealing with in terms of how we would shoot it were pretty true to the final assets. Right, right. right. Then you were like moving your actual character, your CG lion or your, you know, CG panda bear. And then you could move them about the actual set that the production or had, production designer had worked on. So you know, then it was really easy to resolve all the spatial issues and at the same time, you know, work out any story issues that you were solving. And so you gotcha. kind of keep on. Um, so pre-visualization became, you know, the sort of, um, you know, what it is now, it's the sandbox where you explore how to shoot things, you generate a lot of coverage, and then you're, you're using uh, tools, whether they're within software or uh, out external nonlinear editors to kind of define which cameras and you know, for what length of coverage you need to do. Um, so at DreamWorks, they had you know, two different departments. They basically had a rough layout department and final layout department. Okay. And rough layout initially was you know, sort of the storyboard process where you convert it into 3D and then you know, evolved into the pre-visualization process, which was you know, sandbox working through generating coverage and then determining the edit. And then, so when you finish the previous process, you would then deliver all of your final shots cleaned up and ready to, for production assets to the final layout department. And the final layout department ended up being sort of the um, support team for 
ingesting everything that was coming out of pre-visualization, making sure that it worked with the final assets, and then handing it off to all the various departments within the, you know, the downstream of the pipeline. So animation, uh, character effects, visual effects. Lighting. And then, yeah, it's lighting, exactly. And then supporting those departments as they kind of went through the rest of the production pipeline. Now, how would that play out, just out of curiosity, if, because um, production is never smooth or linear per se. Sure. You have new um, new cuts and things of that nature. Now things have changed. Would you keep with that similar structure and pipeline? Yeah, I mean, um, it's sort of, you know, that's why we always maintain both departments in the layout. Okay. Uh, right? Because there would be certain changes, right, that would come about and it would be like, <laughs> oh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, a story beat has changed in the second act. Right. We rectify that in the first act and, you know, change a line or something like that or change staging. And so, you know, those kind of small amounts of changes, you kind of would navigate with final layout usually. And then they would kind of either recreate a new shot or help animation work within changing the lengths of the shot so that they could kind of make those subtle changes to, you know, specific smaller bits that then just flow back into the pipeline. Right. Other bigger changes, you know, um, we changed the location of where the sequence needs to be. <laughs> yeah. And you guys need to change, you know, shoot this in Alaska instead of down in the desert. And, and so that kind of it would be like, okay, we're going back to the beginning of the pipeline. We're going to start okay. a new version of Freedoms, and then we're going to, you know, shove it back through the whole pipeline. Okay. So we were always kind of balancing that. And that was, you know, one of the primary or principal jobs that I had as the head of layout, you know, on production. So then he was sort of managing the layout department, working with the directors and the producers to determine, you know, what is the most efficient and economical way to kind of keep this production moving. And so you were always like in all the editorial dailies in you know, the animation dailies and sort of hearing, you know, what changes were kind of going through the entire production and then helping to kind of, uh, navigate and um, delegate the work out appropriately within the department. Gotcha. Now, just out of curiosity too, obviously DreamWorks being a, a big studio, were there any aspects of your generalist background that came into play at being a previous artist there? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, th I think the thing about pre-visualization is that it is a generalist role. It is a role where you are, you know, trying your best to uh, create a 3D visual roadmap for a bit, you know, virtual pipeline and starting from scratch with no assets. And so having the, the knowledge, the background knowledge of, you know, how things are modeled, how things are rigged, what it takes to do visual effects, you know, animation, all of that, you know, kind of plays into pre-visualization. And so our pre-visualization team always ended up being sort of this um, elite unit of people that came with all different backgrounds and that that sort of made us a mini production pipeline right so you had some artists who are strong at you know modeling and generating assets and you had uh, other artists who could rig characters and you had other artists who were good at visual effects and you know being able to do a little bit of each of those things made it you a utilitarian player so that you could kind of contribute and keep everybody moving. Oh, that's cool. And then it, you know, especially in an animation pipeline, you know, you're, you're generating everything from scratch. Right. And so the, the ability to talk to the other departments that are specializing in that mm -hmm. to kind of work with them so that you are moving forward in the best way possible, whether it's, you know, you deciding to create the assets because you can, you just need a quick turnaround and you need to create this prop for delivery the next morning, or this is a new character that we're going to have to deal with for the entire show. Let's have it go through the modeling and character design and rigging process so that we can leverage off of what we're using in previs and then make that, you know, an entire, um, an asset that is viable for the entire production. Sorry, I'm going to turn that. No problem. Uh, you know, I think in terms of having generalists in pre-visualization, um, you know, the, the, the way that a previous department um, has to function is that you, you have to be able to uh, be nimble and you have to be able to generate a lot of content quickly and, and be able to edit that content and make those changes quickly. And so when I'm, whenever I'm teaching the class, I'm trying to impress upon students that, you know, we're learning a workflow 
that can be tedious at the beginning of the workshop because it seems like you're kind of just breaking down assets or you're kind of itemizing what needs to be built and you're sort of assembling your scene. But what we try to teach them is a structure that we came upon through you know, years of move, making moves at DreamWorks that allowed us to be really flexible so that when you got that you know, six o'clock call from the director that says, we have a screening this weekend and we need you guys to change these 20 shots because we think this is gonna test better so that we don't get killed on this story beat that we you know, changed the third act. You can then make that change really quickly and so you can then go into this, you know, this structure that you've set up and pick up a shot, whether it's yours or somebody else's, and, and go through and make those changes really quickly. And so gotcha. great visualization is sort of all about, you know, not just having those generalist skills, but also learning the organizational structure to kind of work very efficiently. Gotcha. I like how you said, you know, if a uh, director calls you at six o'clock, that sounds like that's not um, hypothetical. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Um, you know, it, like, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, one of the reasons that I got into animation was because um, I played soccer growing up. Okay. And I, I loved that team aspect of mm. playing soccer. And, you know, like, you know, like I said, in the pre-visualization pre team, like having all those role players who had special skill sets, but then came together to make something, you know, really great happen. Yeah. And, you know, soccer is that same way. It's a team sport. And, and, and so when I was studying animation or studying illustration, actually learning how to paint and draw, like that was just me hours of, you know, spending time in my studio, very lonely, learning how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got, you know, up to Vancouver and worked at Mainframe and especially at Rough Draft, you know, all of a sudden there was a family and there was a team of people that you were collaborating with. To and make accomplishing something, something together. Cool. Exactly. Accomplish something uh, great, uh, great together that you could not have done on your own. And, and so that's, you know, like why I really love working in animation, why I made that big shift and, and why I really like teaching students too, because I feel like, you know, the students kind of learn the skill set that hopefully they can go on and make really great things with other collaborators. Yeah, very cool. Now, at your time at DreamWorks, you were also uh, kind of in a lead, posi lead position? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how did that transition and, and what were your roles as a lead in layout? Um, so that, yeah, I think the transition just sort of came out of uh, me being there long enough uh, that I sort of was getting maybe annoying in the meetings where I was like, well, he's, he's talking too much. Let's just put him in charge. Because <laughs> 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 it was, you know, like you, you know, if you're there long enough and you have an understanding of like the, the landscape of, you know, how things work within the pipeline and, and you can help people work more efficiently. That's, you know, how I sort of ended up viewing my role as a manager, which was, mm -hmm. you know, helping, you know, my other artists, my collaborators work in the most efficient way possible. And, and gotcha. so then it, was a, it was a matter of like, uh, you know, like I said, me being the point person for the department, talking with the different creative uh, department leads, and then sort of helping to communicate what was needed to the artist so that the artist could work as efficiently as possible. So, um, you know, for me, I was just a, a, a really enjoyable way of, you know, helping other artists make great stuff. Very cool. I'm sure that helps out then to be an instructor here because you're kind of doing the same thing with the, uh, the students in your class. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's weird. I kind of take it as like a, a way for me to kind of continue doing that role. <laughs> I'm just sort of, and being like the head of layout for this production <laughs> that I animate. <laughs> Is there any particular um, aspects of previs that you personally enjoy better? Is it, you know, I, I really just love the uh, working the camera angles and uh, focal lengths and making it feel more cinematic or is it the, like you mentioned, you know, you've got some rigging and hey, I really like being able to rig up a prop that now works in this that, you know, couldn't have done otherwise, you know. Is there any aspect of it that you really personally enjoy? Um, I don't, uh, well, hopefully this doesn't sound like a cop out, <laughs> but I think I kind of enjoy all aspects of it. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think what I, um, what I enjoy about pre-visualization is that it's not just, you know, sort of this technical process, but it's, it's a filmmaking process, right? We're really, okay. we're teaching people, like I said, we're teaching people the structure but we're also kind of laying down the groundwork for strong filmmaking and strong uh, cinematic staging. 
And so the thing that I really enjoy the most is like once you've finished the sh uh, shot or a sequence of shots and you've created a moment that you kind of like to watch over and over again, that's something that about it that's either inspiring to you or, you know, really um, interesting in the way that I'll look at the way I successfully, uh, you know, made that character turn or, you know, so like there's little things that I think you, you just try to find that are attracted to you. And if, Hopefully the idea is that if you are not sick of watching it a hundred times, then the audience is going to be interested to see it that first time. And, right. You know, that's going to keep them, you know, propel them to continue to watching and be inspired by, you know, whatever it is you're making. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's all sorts of aspects of it um, that are enjoyable at times and can be incredibly tedious at times. <laughs> but I think the, the best thing really is like when you finish the thing and if it's still something that you can appreciate and, and feel proud of, then, you know, that's, you know, that's always the best. Feeling. Very cool. Was there any particular projects at DreamWorks? You were there for 13 years. Yeah, I was there for 13 years. Uh, particular, particular projects. Project that, yeah. That stand out to you that you just like, man, I really love that one. Or this one was very challenging. Um, uh, yeah. So the one that I always talk about in the class too, if people join us is the, uh, the Penguins of Madagascar. So it's a project that was super challenging and it was uh, a project that nobody really saw. <laughs> In the end, it was probably the least successful project that I worked on. <laughs> but the reason that I, I, I enjoy that project so much is that that was probably one of the most difficult creative challenges that we had. Um, okay, why is that? So we, um, we were making this movie, um, oh, I can't get the timelines wrong, but I think we were making it in 20. For, uh, in 2014, in the um, in the spring of 2014, we were basically halfway done with that movie, maybe not even halfway done. And we had a test screening um, with another film that was in production. Um, you know, both of us tested that week. Our movie tested really well. The other movie did not. Um, because our movie tested well, they said we're swapping your release date. <laughs> oh, good. So even though we thought we had another <laughs> to finish the movie, we suddenly had six months to finish <laughs> So like basically, yeah, we got some good news and some bad news. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we grew from a, a very small team of, you know, like six to 10 artists to uh, me <clears throat> and a team of, I think we had like 24 previous artists across three locations. Wow. So San Francisco, Los Angeles and Bangalore. Yeah. And then in also not just our previous team, but our entire production had to, you know, triple in number just to meet that advanced deadline. Goodness. So it was this incredible, incredible creative challenge, a logistical challenge to kind of get everybody working together on the same page. But the thing was, is that everybody was so motivated, was so excited about the possibilities based on our screening that it really was a fun production because you know, this was sort of me going back to those 100 hour weeks of, of, you know, working on Futurama, but I was doing it again with a team that I was, you know, a, a group of collaborators that I loved being with. And, mm. and so we were all, it, it, you know, like you, you really get those moments um, in a production, if you're lucky, where everybody is on the same page, everything is flowing nicely. And even under incredible duress, you know, everybody's having a good time forged the fire huh yeah exactly and so even though the movie came out and wasn't a success for various reasons um it's still something that i look at on uh, very fondly do you think uh the time difference would have changed the movie oh for sure okay yeah it would have you would it would have been a different movie um it's hard to say whether it would have been better i think you know just if you look at the logistics of the release date it would have done better for sure mm. um but um you know, we got it done. And, yeah, yeah. You know, like, it was still uh, a fun movie. It was still yeah, a fun movie. Yeah. Some beautiful animation. Um, one of our alumni, uh, Ravi uh, yeah. Govin, had won an Annie from the yeah, uh, yeah. with the octopus. So yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, still a fun movie. Yeah. Um, so that one was. So does that kind of answer both questions I had? Then one of your favorites and most challenging. Yeah, that was definitely the most challenging. <laughs> 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 I feel like that one was uh, pretty challenging. Um, uh, the, uh, sorry to, to not to jump ahead, but like you know, to my time at Industrial Light Magic, mm. um, working on Rogue One was pretty challenging as well. Um, Why is that? 
I think that was, um, it was challenging for me personally as because that was my first live action, full live action production there. So mm -hmm. learning how ILM works, um, you know, what their workflow was. And also because, you know, that movie similarly had a lot of changes that happened in the last uh, six months of production. Wow. So it wasn't like we moved up our release date. But, um, you know, there were things that changed story-wise that the, you know, the studio and the, and the directors kind of made shifts that happened at the end. And they were all for the better. And, you know, that movie is sort of the opposite, right? Like, you know, there were all changes that we made in the last six months, and that was a huge success. Gotcha, yeah. Um, and I, and I um, but, you know, like, again, a very fun team to work with. Um, everybody from top to bottom, you know, was wonderful collaborators. You know, getting to work with John Knoll and and learn from him was an amazing experience. And um, yeah, it was just a great production to be on. Now, how different was the pipeline from full animation to VFX, like Rogue One? Yeah, so I, uh, not just Rogue One, but VFX in general is a very, especially now, is a, um, is a pipeline that's very fractured. So, you know, when you're working on a feature animation, Generally, you know, even if you're doing a client vendor relationship, you, you have a core group of creatives that are doing the front end of the pipeline, and then you have a core group that's doing sort of the back end of the pipeline. And in visual effects, you still have a core group that's doing the front end of the pipeline, typically, like you have an art director and a previous team and, and you know, uh, writers and editors. But then, you know, what happens is you have sequences that are getting sent out to various effects houses and and various vendors that are then completing little parts of the movie and so you you find yourself collaborating not just with you know that front end team but also other studios that are doing uh, various parts of the pipeline gotcha so it becomes a very interesting challenge to you know this logistical challenge to work through this network and figure out the best way to kind of get things done um, in a way that is both economical and timely for delivering, you know, this movie for the release dates. Um, it's, it's funny, like I was telling my wife the other day, like, I feel like I had this very uh, palatial, calm demeanor coming out of future animation. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got into visual effects and I just I was like, man, these guys are just like working like mercenaries. They're so you know, hard hitting and it's like, you're just cutting through this work. But, you know, spending time in that environment, you really understand because there is a reason why you have to be that way. You have to be so efficient and specialized at your work. And the, the margin for error is so tiny because you're not just, you know, working in this pipeline where you have created everything from scratch, but you're generally working off of a source material or a plate. Mm. that then needs to be integrated into the visual effects world. And so, um, you know, making sure that the match move is tight, making sure that the, the character integration is tight, like really, all of those things are like, you know, uh, are done to pixel precision. Um, to a fault, I feel like, because I, you know, I think you, you talk to an audience member these days and they have very little understanding. Right, no clue amount of modification that has been made to you know what has been presented to them and, gotcha um, you know it's really amazing what is done in visual effects um, for now i'm in a little 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 bit of like the cat out of the bag this is for those that are listening this is uh our second attempt at this podcast um, yeah. <laughs> to my fault uh the podcast was going great and i realized i did not push record last time so um <laughs> The reason why I say that is because I know you mentioned something when we talked last time about some type of technology that allowed um, to kind of match things a little better. Yeah. So what was that again? Um, so I think what we were talking about last time was photogrammetry. Yes, that's right. Yes. And we were talking about photogrammetry in relationship to match move work. So this is also something that I kind of uh, gained a lot of experience in working, in, uh, working at ILM. So what essentially happens now on a set is, you know, you, you shoot your camera work and, you know, that camera work has to be tracked into the computer so that you can have a virtual camera that mirrors the movement that was done on set. Mm. Um, and, you know, typically 
that work was done by uh, taking set photos and sort of like putting these kind of very rudimentary uh, alignments of a 3D set in, in your virtual world and then trying to track your camera to those like rough measurements that you had taken on set and then tracking you know little markers that you used as identifiers. What has happened in the last few years with the advent of uh, photogrammetry is that you can now take a series of photographs or even just walk through and take some footage, throw that into the computer. The computer then uh, tracks, does a lot of that tracking for you and then recreates a three-dimensional model with you know, full color textures of what you've shot by you know, regenerating those camera positions that you recorded. So then you have a virtual asset that you can then, you know, if scaled uh, appropriately to your virtual camera, you can then use to track exactly. And so you can see whether your camera is lining up with the plate, you know, by pixel because you right. know you're using a 3D asset to track into your 2D plate. That's crazy. And that's what makes that integration so seamless is that, you know, if you've done your match move correctly, if you've recreated your lens distortion accurately, you know, then you are, you know, fully sitting, you know, CG assets in the exact 3D space at which they were shot. And then they can then seamlessly hopefully with you know, what your plate is. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, obviously it makes that process a little easier. How does it translate to on film with the audiences? Does it, uh, cause you, like you said, you know, the audience doesn't know hardly anything of what we do. Um, because then, we wouldn't be doing our job right, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think what it translates to is, um, you know, the shot counts that we've seen in visual effects movies over the last decade has gone up. Uh, okay. So, you know, the argument always comes up when you have a movie like A Lion King, you know, like people keep saying it's a live action remake. Well, actually it's not, it's a, you know, it's an all CG movie and it's the same, Thing almost with you know any other live action movie live action visual effects movie is like it's hard to determine what whether it's still a live action movie or whether it's just you know an all CG film because you know allowing us to use compute process and algorithms to do this work um, in in a higher volume just allows the filmmakers a lot more freedom to make changes, mm. you know, much later on. So, um, it, you know, I, I think ultimately it's all great, right? But it, it, it does, you know, it just creates this sort of, I think it creates a false expectation for audiences in terms of, you know, like how much work a CG artist had to do <laughs> versus like, oh, people, look at that awesome set they made. And like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people, okay, just stay for the credits. Just watch the credits. Right, right, yeah. And you'll realize how much work, and then people are like, yeah, I know. I'm like, yeah. they're just scrolling and scrolling. You know, I recently watched, uh, obviously, um, Endgame. Yeah. Just unreal. Um, the amount and in studio and then have a list and the new studio yeah. and all the lists, you yeah. know, yeah. uh, just phenomenal, just yeah. phenomenal what goes into it. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I think that the, the, the fun thing is like when a movie comes out and like, I always know like that I have friends who've worked on a movie because my Facebook feed will then be populated with screenshots of the credits list with a map to like <laughs> their name. I'm here. <laughs> like, you know, like that's kind of like, I wait 10 minutes for it to scroll to me, but there yes. I am. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so now you spent, like you said about 13 years at DreamWorks and then yeah. from there you went to ILM. No, actually before that I went to Ilion animation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like that was a cool opportunity. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, I finished at DreamWorks, I think, uh, in April. And then, you know, as I was literally driving home, had cleaned out my office, got a call from a former producer who knew that I was leaving and said, hey, I'm working on a production in Spain. Can you come help us? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so it went for me, like, on this drive home going, like, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, so I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Probably my wife going, hey, do you want to go spend the summer in Spain? <laughs> Gosh. Okay, I'm learning Spanish right now. Yeah. And, uh, so, and then we have got, you know, the, span the 
Spain, Spaniard community. Yeah. Phenomenal artist. Yes. And so she's, I've been keeping up to, you know, just, and it, Spain looks like it's amazing, a, yes. a beautiful place to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, what a neat opportunity to, yeah, let's go there for the summer. Yeah, exactly. And it was, <laughs> and, and it was really, um, a fan, uh, you know, like I said before, you know, you're really lucky if you can find a place where you have a production team that you enjoy working with and everybody mm -hmm. gets along. And, you know, I just happened to go from PDI, which was this amazing family of creatives, to going to Ilion, which was this amazing uh, collaborative community of artists in Spain. Um, a lot of them were uh, Spanish nationals. Um, you know, a lot of the senior artists had come from other studios like Pixar and ILM and oh, okay. Wolfpack Studios. So they, it was like them having an opportunity to come home and work at home in Madrid. And then a bunch of young artists, like just so much talent there who are all really young, super enthusiastic and uh, really excited to work on their uh, first feature animated film. And, and you know, uh, Elian had worked on other feature animated movies before, but this was sort of their first time working with a big Hollywood studio and then being, you know, the, the vendor for them, uh, for Paramount Pictures, basically okay. delivering a full feature animation for them. For that was for um, a music part, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, what were some of the, the challenges that you had going into why they pulled you on? Yeah. So the um, you know one of the reasons that I got a call from Trip was that they had basically gotten into this bad cycle with Paramount, where uh, Paramount would send them storyboards and say, "This is you know the movie that you're making. We need the sequence done in six weeks." And Elion would just go, yeah, sure, no problem. Because <laughs> they were so enthusiastic. They were so excited and, and, and ready to please. But, you know, what I was brought into was to give it a more uh, discerning eye. And gotcha. help create a, a more um, productive conversation with Paramount and say, well, you know what? This sequence looks like it's actually going to take us 12 weeks. But you have this other sequence here that looks like it's a little bit simpler if we took out this shot or we simplified with the staging here. What if we did this sequence in you know, three weeks and then gave us more time to deliver the other sequence and then we reorganized the structure? And so it was a lot of you know, just helping them with the production dialogue of you know, this is what it's going to take to do in pre -biz, and this is how we can best deliver this sequence. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it, rather than Paramount getting upset about like, you know, why isn't our movie getting delivered as we promised, it was more about parent, you know, setting expectations for everyone appropriately so that we could say, you know, this, we want to make this great movie, but here's the way we're going to do it on time, on budget, et cetera. Gotcha. And that makes sense. You know, you think about any relationship, even if it's, you know, husband, wife, whatever, unmet, unmet expectations is a big issue. Yeah. But you go, if you understand why. Yes. Oh, okay. That scene's going to do this, this, and that. Okay. Right. That makes sense now. And everybody's on the same page now, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was, it was a lot of fun for me kind of getting the energy from the artists and their enthusiasm, but then also helping them learn, you know, like how to navigate the, the structure. With the client. Like, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Um, so in, any additional uh, anecdotes or, um, you know, at, with your time over there in Spain and, and that crew? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that made me you know, I, I went from um, sort of, you know, so when I left DreamWorks, they had actually shut down our Redwood City facility. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, sort of a sad time because we had this great family of PEI that was sort of, you know, scattering to the winds. But then going to Ilion was like this breath of fresh air and seeing, you know, well, this, you know, is the end of something, but also the start of, you know, this whole other shift in animation and, uh, you know, feature production. Gotcha. You know, uh, Europe in general, like you said, there's a lot of enthusiasm in Spain. And across Europe, I feel like um, there is this explosion of talent that is coming uh, about, um, both from the, the cost of compute coming down substantially, but also just from, you know, things like iAnimate and other schools being able to train artists, having, you know, artists who've gained a lot of experience be able to communicate using the internet, using, you know, all sorts of various uh, channels to educate new artists and new talent. And so, you know, I felt like you had this growth and this explosion of people in, in Europe being, you know, having 
watched and being fed Hollywood content for years and being excited and motivated by that, but now have this opportunity to create their own, you know, films and create their own content. And so, right. you know, I, I think, um, you know, when you look at things like um, Spider-Verse, for instance, you know, that movie, even though done in Vancouver, was originally led creatively by a Spanish animator. Hmm. And so, you know, that, that kind of talent coming from all sorts of, sorts of places across the globe and taking, you know, their own cultural influences and then fusing it back into, you know, other things that are getting made makes for new and interesting stuff. Right, right. right. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. And I think one of the things that you mentioned uh, before I thought was really cool was just talking about their culture there. Yeah. Kind of grown up in that artistic atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, for us, getting a chance to live in Spain was amazing in that, you know, I would be able to take the train back home after finishing work in Las Rosas, go to Madrid, walk through Soroya's house, which was, you know, his old painting studio mm. that had been converted into a museum, walk down and go to, um, you know, the other, uh, you know, m museums like right along the main row in Madrid. And then on the weekend, I could take bullet train and go to uh, Barcelona and go see Park Way and go look at all the, you know, gallery buildings. And so you have this group of, of uh, artists who have grown up around this, have been, you know, had that surrounded in them and fused, you know, within their creative DNA mm -hmm. and just sort of having those conversations with them, you know, having them have that background really made um, a lot of interest and, you know, made for really stimulating and interesting creative choices because they had that, you know, deep creative cultural background. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's fantastic. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, how old are your kids? Uh, my kids are eight and 10. Okay. So yeah. anything, the reason why I asked that is because obviously you're an artist. Is there anything now having what you've learned there in Madrid in regards to their, how they're part of their DNA, is there anything that you're looking to infuse with your kids as, as a result with that kind of stuff, expose them more to taking more on museums that you maybe you've not have thought of, you know, doing before you went to uh, Spain or something like that, or. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, I think after our time in Spain, our kids uh, got very wary of going to museums. Okay. <laughs> kind of like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of the problem with kids. It's like, they can't appreciate it. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, you know, I think, um, it, 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 it did have an influence on our kids. Um, just being in that environment for the months, the few months that they were there. So, you know, they always talk about, um, the, um, you know, the time that they had in Spain, the different in architectural sites that they saw. They remember going to um, Sagrada Familia and seeing the church in Barcelona. And they, okay. they, they had that experience of going to that epic building and having that the shower of color coming down from the same Very glass. Cool. And, you know, I think, um, for instance, we took them to a Dali museum in Monterey last weekend. And being able to uh, talk to them about Dali in, in context of talking about Picasso's Guernica because they saw that painting in Spain. Wow. So, you know, it certainly has had a tremendous effect on them, you know, just being able to have this kind of cultural dialogue. And, and That's cool. Having that touch them for them of like knowing, like, you know, they saw that painting and this right, is right. You know, related to that. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it's neat. That's why, that's why I always like getting kind of, um, getting to the person in these podcasts. It's always just neat. Like you mentioned, I, I did a, I was wrestled, you know, so mine yeah. wasn't so much a team sport, yeah. but there was aspects of that that I've taken to, um, to my career. But yeah. I can see where you're playing something like soccer, where it's a very team sport. Yeah. You're learning to depend upon one another, set up other people. Yeah. That's part of your DNA. So it's just yeah. always neat for me to hear how people have come up into this and how it's affected their, yeah. them as an artist. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, that's one of the things that I really love uh, about teaching the pre class for my animate is that like what I will frequently do is show them sequences from a production that I've worked on and students will have questions about like, well, how long did that take or who did that thing or, you know, and so then it's sort of me remembering and kind of re-disseminating re the same, you know, knowledge to them so that, you know, they can sort of understand like this is how this could work in a production. That's great. How you can tackle this in your own work. Very cool. Yeah. 
Now from um, Ilion, where did you move to from there? Because I know you mentioned that you worked as well as that on the Star Wars Clone Wars. Was that still at ILM? Okay, so <laughs> this is a, another kind of long history, and then I always feel old when I talk about this. So <laughs> I worked on that Clone Wars, which was the original 2D animated. Wow, okay. Uh, Gandhi Tartakovsky directed. So right after Futurama got canceled, I think for the second time, we uh, picked up the contract from uh, Cartoon Network to do this 2D animated show uh, for the Clone Wars. And so these were like 20 shorts that were put out. Um, and I think at the time, it was just sort of Lucas trying to leverage off of his new uh, toy license. The, gotcha. the <laughs> But, you know, it was really great because I felt like, you know, Gandhi was just taking his Samurai Jack knowledge and then applying it to Star Wars. You know, it was like just nothing but action. And, That's you know, awesome. Very shots and in these, you know, very kind of bite-sized one-minute shorts. Um, so I worked on that before I, you know, went off to go work at DreamWorks. Okay, okay. And then uh, when I got to ILM, I finished work on, um, I had just finished work on Solo. Ah. And so there was a gap in uh, production time and uh, they were restarting the 3D version of the Clone Wars at Lucasfilm Animation. Okay. So then I went over and worked on, you know, a few episodes of that show. Awesome. Before going back to ILM. So I've worked on all versions of the <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got two questions in. One is, how was it working? Okay, so what was your role on the 2D one? Because as a previs artist, that would seem yeah, opposite. So you, yeah. You know, you're 2D. working in 3D in previs, but this is 2D. Yeah, so the, the 2D work back then, so you have to remember this was early in my career, right after Futurama. So it was essentially the same pipeline. Of, uh, we would get these shots from Gendi. Um, we would know that we needed to build these ships or build these droids in, and make them in 3D, integrate them with the 2D animation. Okay, so it was a hybrid then. So it was a hybrid back then. Ah, uh, okay. So um, a lot of fun though, in terms of like working out the timing, you know, getting Gendi sensibilities and then mm. kind of creating this volume. There's a lot of like giant space battles and, and robots. Um, so, you know, that was a really fun show. And then, uh, were you going to ask me about the... My second thing? question was, is okay. how was it working on something that was a 2D one now with... A oh, the 3D one. Yeah, so the 3D one, um, so that was an interesting process and in sort of learning um, how... Because, you know, what happened later on was that that was a success. They did sell a lot of toys. <laughs> and then Lucas was like, I want to make more of that, but in a longer format. <laughs> And then him deciding that he was going to jump into making an all 3D CG version of the show um, okay. for economic and creative reasons. And, and so they had come up with this pipeline and this uh, special tool set that George had the people write for him, um, which was called uh, Zviz. And, and so, Z-Biz? yeah, and it's, okay. it's, a, it's essentially a, um, it's a previous tool that's, it's almost like a previous storyboarding tool. And so that learning that tool in terms of their pre-visualization process and, uh, and then figuring out that pipeline that they had developed for the 3D version of Clone Wars was very different from that show. That show is uh-huh. sort of like, you know, here's a storyboard, here's a shot, you know, go and finish it. Gotcha. Versus Clone Wars 3D was, you know, here's my script. I want to make, I want to see a 3D storyboard of this script and then let's, we'll deliver it, shoot it, and then re time out the episode before we deliver to the uh, overseas vendor for final production. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, any preference on which one you preferred? Uh, well, I mean, they're both really interesting. They're different. One is a very long, you know, uh, I feel like one was like this sort of like a visual action fest. I can't, one, yeah. yeah, the other one was a space opera, right? Gotcha. The other one was like a soap opera that was like um, George and um, uh, you know that crew, they were trying to tell longer format stories over a bigger arc, right? Gotcha, gotcha, very cool. Um, so it was, and then from Ilion back to ILM, 
So Ilion, a little bit of time working in VR for okay. you know a couple of startups that were going on in the Bay Area at the time. Um, uh, you know, it was, was that a pretty time. dynamic shift for you working in VR? It was because it was, um, you know, we had kind of gone. It, it was the shift is really in the rendering paradigm, where uh, you know, for years and years, we've made movies where we kind of um, we do one version of the of the movie. We see we work with one version of the movie, and then you send it to render, right? And then that rendering process ups the fidelity so that you can sort of see like this is what the lighting looks like, and this right, is what right. the effects look like. Now with VR, everything had to be done in real time, right? Because it had to be experienced and generated so that the, the viewer could look in full stereo, see the parallax in real time. And so it was utilizing game engines and that technology so that it was rendered on the fly. And so um, having to, it was sort of shifting the paradigm of like, oh, we're just gonna build this proxy version of the thing before we make the thing to, no, we're making the thing and this is what we're, you, you're, we're doing with. and delivering, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So now how much, uh, just to kind of sh shift here a little bit as we kind of close, what is it that you're teaching in your previous class? What is it? Cause it's, it's a single class. So what is it that someone would experience saying, Oh yeah, I'd love to join that one. I, I could use some of that. Or, you know, what is it that in this 11 week class yeah. are you trying to accomplish? So, um, you know, uh, like I've kind of hinted at a little bit, it, it's basically a filmmaking class mm. where um, people who have, you know, some basic working knowledge of how to you know, work with Maya are then learning how to use Maya to make a film. And so we, we start at the very beginning. The first class is sort of looking at, at movies and, and sort of saying, you know, what, it is, what is it about these sequences that is cool and what is it that we like as an audience? And then breaking it down over the course of the, the, the workshop so that we kind of start from scratch and say, here's our storyboards or our script, and then building up so that in the final week you are, you're making editorial and artistic changes on mm. a full sequence that you've developed. Gotcha. So it's taking you through the, the production stages so that you learn how to assemble your assets, create your 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 pipeline within your own box so that you can then create an animated sequence and make your own movie and so it's a little bit of, of it's sort of split between learning the fundamentals of the technology and the workflow and also learning you know the fundamentals of real filmmaking and how a director would work on set with the camera and make creative choices about what shots he was going to use. Mm. very very cool that's fantastic well, we appreciate you being here and teaching in the class as well as doing this podcast. I was glad this worked out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. this time. Yes. No, it was great. And hopefully uh, just as fresh as the first one. That's right. That's right. It will be for every, every listener. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Conan, I really, again, I appreciate your time. It was really get, great to get in a talk with you about this stuff. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Larry. This was great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah.